So I'm going to do a bit of using today with next week. So if there's questions you haven't, you've got this week, keep them to next week because we'll be going over some of the areas and adding a little bit more into it. And uh, I, I, was, I was actually going to be doing something completely different today, actually. But I sat down and I thought, well, what could I do that, um, what, what could I do that I could do over two weeks? And I thought the Vikings. So I was going to do the Vikings this week and I'll do something else next week, but I'll do the Vikings this week and next week. And then the, probably the last one I'll do of this series uh, will be looking at uh, look, looking at some various discoveries that have been made in in the four areas of Cumbria, Cymru, Cornwall, and Orkney. So, when when you think of Orkney, you've got a sense of Viking everywhere, and you go to the cathedral in the centre of Orkney, Kirkwall Cathedral, which we can visit next week. That's fine. And it was is dedicated to Saint Magnus, who was a Viking, and it was constructed constructed in around 1136. And the the cathedral itself um, is very much Viking looking, and it, it's a fascinating site indeed. The another another site that that springs to mind is this site. It, it's a it's a Viking site on the, the southern side of the main island of Orkney, and it's a site known as Orpha. It's, it's Viking. It, it's, um, there's a nice information centre that uh, was open the day we were actually there, actually. And it, it's a site known as Orpha. And we mentioned this last week, actually, the area of Orpha, because there was the two factions on Orkney fighting amongst themselves. And we mentioned that last week when we looked at the battles in these four areas. And all for itself is an intriguing circular church. So Vikings weren't always pagan and, and very much when you get into the periods of the 900s, the, the Vikings are very much Christian. So obviously they're building churches. And when you think about Greenland and you think about Eric the Red and going to Greenland and his wife wanting to convert him to being a Christian because she was a Christian. So you've got this little bit of a backdrop. And I've got a nice little bit of a text that I'd like to read out about the Vikings in Orkney as well. So that, that I thought that would be a, nicely appropriate. And we're going naturally back to the Vikings in Orkney next week as well. So that, that's the building. I, I remember there was, Bill, um, there was Bill, Kathy and Peter Roxy and Bronny and Michelle standing there and I took a photograph of them with this backdrop, this, this, this real rather interesting building. It's a little bit of a tower we just saw, saw is there and, that, and then what we've then got is the, the, this sort of building from inside. So lots of it is gone in a very interesting graveyard actually with different graves associated with the First and Second World War. And I'm not really sure whether, uh, th I think there was some German graves there, actually. I'm not sure. There's something quite strange about it. Mm -hmm. So with, it, with this, if we, um, if we look at this, we, we, think of, we think of Orkney and there's, there's, there's Earl Thorvin's palace marked at a place called Burze. Now, I, I think Pete's been to Bursley with me. I know Pat's been to Bursley with me. Yeah. Yep. And that's Orkney. And, and there's there's a there's a palace. That there's there's an earldom, a Viking earldom palace there, like fairly an edifice from the 13, 14, 1500. But there's remains of a very early Viking church associated with Bursley as well. So that's where we are. That that's that's Orkney. And maybe. Uh, as a backdrop, let, let's just look at the notes that I've actually got. So that's what I'm going to do now. So always when I'm always when I'm trying to find odd things about Orkney, there, there's a there's a website out there called Orkney Jar, as it's spelled, Orkney J A R on the end, Orkney Jar, and it, it's a rather interesting 
and the information is quite good on that. And when I was when I was looking at this Orkney Jar website, the Norse colonization. So it's saying by by the 1200s, the fact that Norway was a part of uh, fat start again, the fact that Orkney was a part of Norway and fell under Norwegian jurisdiction is without question. The island's culture, language and way of life were entirely that of an, a Norse earldom. So back to, I, back to what I said at the beginning, when, when you think about Orkney, you, 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 you've got this Viking link always. It, it, it smells Viking, but it smells Pictish, it smells medieval, it smells Scottish, everything's there. But although there can be no doubt as to the extent of the Scandinavian colonization, very little is actually known about the early days of Viking Orkney. So that building behind me there is, is, is not in the early days. It's not in the 700s. It's a little bit later when the, uh, when the Vikings started to become Christianized on Orkney. The circumstances surrounding the, the first Norse arrivals on Orkney and, and Shetland as well, and in parts of Northern Scotland, North Eastern Scotland, and the eventual takeover of Orkney remains hotly debated to this day. So if I, if I wanted to get really hotly debated, um, it would be what happened to the Picts. So here we go. When did the first Viking settlers arrive? Did they integrate with the indigenous Orcadians? Now, I've, I've, I've given a whole talk about this, a long talk, actually. Um, or were the islands deserted when the Vikings got there? So there's two arguments, the, the, the Viking, the, the island of Orkney, forget Shetland a minute, well, forget Shetland, we're not doing that. The, 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 the island of Orkney is said to have been completely deserted when the Vikings got there because there was some desert, disease wiped out the Picts. We know the Picts were there, they're, they're the natives of the island and the natives of Scotland, and we've got Pictish stonework. Carl? Yeah? When I was in Orkney, not with you on my own. Uh, while I was there, the uh, the, the pr prince and princess of Norway. I wanted were, you to mention that came to came to Kirkwall to the cathedral for a service. So there is still there is still a connection with Norway and Orkney. I wanted you to mention that, and you, you did that. You did that exactly on cue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That 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 you did that exactly on cue. Exactly. So the question is. You know, did they occupy an island that was completely deserted? Is there evidence to say that they, inter, um, they interbred with the Pictish people, the Orcadians? Or were the natives slaughtered by the newcomers? The, these are all questions we cannot answer completely. I like to feel that it would be, it would be a mad idea to invade Orkney. And, and wipe all the native people out because you need people to farm the land and to feed you and so on. So that's not, it's not a, that's not a starter really. But what we think about with Orkney is, is that as, as part of Britain, it, it's, the, it's the first part that we actually get Vikings sort of settling. Whenever they settled, whether they settled in 700 or earlier than that, later on what we do find is that the first Viking raids in Britain are recorded in the um, 790s, 793, there about, and sometimes before as well, by which time it seems likely that the Norse already had a foothold in Orkney. And when when it talks about when it talks about Lindisfarne and it talks about the the Norsemen, the, the people of the north, the, the, the Northmen, not not the Norse, the North as in North. They, they, it's discussion that those North men were actually from Orkney. This gets confusing again. They were Norse men as well because they were from Norway. So it's the Norwegians, Norse, North, North from Orkney. That was the description. And they would all, already got a, sh a foothold on Orkney. How that interaction was, it for me, is, is more that they probably intertwined with the local people. That makes more sense. And we, we have, that. there's lots of, that there's so much Viking stuff when we think about 
Orkney that I could do a whole talk on it. I, I, I don't want to don't do that whole talk today because I wanted to do some other things as well. So we could do a bit more next week. So the island's strategic position off the north coast of Scotland and at the centre of the Viking Sea Roads made them the obvious choice as a base for further expansion and raids into Scotland Island. And this is when we get lots of, we, we do actually have Viking burials, like the one, at the, the one on the island of Sanday with lots of Viking objects. There's other Viking burials within the Orkney archipelago as well. So there, there's lots of those sort of inter, interbinding links with the, um, no, uh, with the Vikings and Orkney. The extent of this early settlement is unclear, as we've mentioned, but although there had um, probably been some contact between Orkney and Norway for some time, either trade, settlement or raiding, it is generally accepted the North only began moving to Orkney in significant numbers by around the 800. So what might be happening, just an idea, and, and there's, there's an important film coming out uh, 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 with about Sutton Who actually, the new new sort of Hollywood film, um, well Netflix film or whatever, about um, about Sutton Who, and some of us argue that the evidence that they find at Sutton Who is actually from Sweden, not Anglo-Saxon. It's not an Anglo-Saxon ship burial, but they say it's an Anglo-Saxon ship burial. But the evidence, Ragwald, and all the rest of it is 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 Swedish evidence. So it's likely that. We, we get the Vikings and sort of those Viking links and so on to a very early age, earlier time than we're told, in like Orkney and other places. And this, this, is, this is what's going on. So there's lots more I can say. There's, there's, there's lots more nice little things about from Orkney Jar in front of me, which I'm not going to do now because I, I just want to try and give a nice little bit of an overview. And I want to, I really want to get to the, I really want to get to the Vikings in Cornwall, actually. Let's look at a couple of images a moment. So we've got this nice little plan. We've been talking about that, um, mentioned about Kirkwall. Uh, Bursa, that really fascinating site on, on that plan there. And it's talking about sort of all these raids and all the sort of inter-movements. And this, this is the site that we've actually been to, this, this site at uh, Bursay, uh, Bruff Head, Bursay, which is on the, the top part of the island of mainland of Orkney. And you've got the Earl's Palace, a Viking Earl's Palace, which is a bit later. And then you go to this spot here, the Bruff, Bruff Head, Bruff of Bursay. There's a really nice arrangement of buildings there, which I, I think we spent a little bit of time there actually until I think somebody somebody started to panic and say the water's coming in, we need to actually get back over to, to the parking because it's um, it, it's it's um, a high high tide. It's it's uh, it's an island. But these these are these wonderful ruins that that we were looking at. F fascinating uh, ruins because you you look at these buildings that that's that's a church building and that sort of red stones and altar and. There were lots of symbols and sort of things on that altar, um, Mason's marks, and there was also I fucking remember. I'm, let me let me remember. There was a, a runic. Uh, there was a stone with um, with weird inscriptions on Pictish inscriptions. And a reconstructed stone because the the original was somewhere else, and that, that's there as well. And in amongst this, there were some long long houses, and there was drainage of the street patterns. A proper proper settlement here, proper Viking settlement has taken over from the Pictish settlement. So this is this was rather fascinating. And obviously high water, it, it, it's land, it, it's um, not landlocked, it's it's an island. And then then on the mainland we, we go to this building known as the Earl's Palace. And the, the this this Earl's Palace itself again is um, there are a number of Palaces like this associated with Orkney. The, 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 there's the Bishop's Palace, which we've which we've mentioned quite some months ago, which is which is in Kirkwall. We mentioned that as a tower house when we looked at that. That's that's sort of Viking origins. We just sort of passed this, and next 
Next. We moved away, we moved away from Orkney straight away. So this is what comparison does. And, and we actually go directly to Cornwall. <coughs> this is a rather interesting story that we're going to look at with Cornwall. And actually, this is a rather interesting map because when, when we looked at this week's lecture on a Tuesday evening and on a Thursday morning uh, and a Thursday afternoon, and obviously when my Ronda class get back, we this week we've been looking at Glastonbury. And I, I, when, when we were looking at Glastonbury, we were talking about lots of the land being flooded and, and you, can, you can clearly see that, can't you, Pete? Yeah. This sort of yellowy area here. This is all sort of, um, this is all floodplain. And it's not a floodplain anymore. But we were talking about that with Glastonbury yesterday. Um, anyway, we, we go, we look to Cornwall and there's, there's a very interesting story about the Vikings in Cornwall, which, which I'm going to give you now. We've got a couple of images and we go to that place, Kingston Down, a battle on the River Tamar. It, it, it does keep the English out, doesn't it? It just keeps the em Emmets out, doesn't it, Pete? So we, we, we've got the Battle of Kingston, which is rather interesting. It's rather interesting because it's it's a different take on what you might think with the people of Cornwall and the Vikings and the King of Wessex and all the rest of it. So you've got the word Wessex there, the great sort of area of Wessex and the Kingdom of Wessex. And then you've got Cornwall there on the left. So what what we what we then do is if we if I go to my little notes, which which I which I've got in front of me, and I've got a little bit of a headline here. And hello. hello. Hi. May I just? Yes. Come on, Roxy. Let's do it from you then. That was good. I got you cake. You got me cake. By the way, guys, I got cake. So bring it over here. Come on. Oh, it's not just for you. No, I want to see. Everyone wants to see the cake. We're looking at the Vikings, right? Everyone wants to see the cake. Oh, by the way, Pete, we got cake. So I see. I see. You'll never be slim like me. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Anyway, good to see you, Roxy and Bronny. They've been away for three weeks because of the COVID. Anyway. So let's get back to this. Let's get back to this. I got so what we've got is I when when I'm when I'm typing doing the research for these classes. So it's like Vikings in Orkney, that was easy to work out. Vikings in Wales, that was easy to work out. Vikings in Cumbria, that was easy to work out. And then the Vikings in Cornwall. So here we go. This is rather interesting headline that I found here. Viking invaders struck deep into the west of England and may have stuck around. Now, the big question is, did the Vikings invade Cornwall or did they assist the kingdom of Cornwall? So I was thinking of this and I was reading through the article. So this is what I'm going to read through. It's well chronicled that wave after wave of Vikings from Scandinavia terrorized Western Europe. For 250 years from around the late 700s and wreaked particular havoc across vast areas of northern England. So there you go. What did they do in the West? There's no shortage of evidence of Viking raids from the church historians of the time, usually about Lindisfarne um, and the North and, and, and Orkney. So it's always about the North. But researchers are now uncovering evidence but the Vikings conquered more of the British Isles than was previously thought, or influenced more of the British Isles than previously thought. This is where we start to then get into Cornwall. And um, we, we, um, Weymouth Bay, for example, which is a, a, a massive load of miles away from Cornwall, um, they, they actually found 300 beheaded Vikings there. At the time, England consisted of four independent kingdoms, Wessex, to the south of the River Thames, and Mercia, which was the border between Wales and the sort of Midlands, East Anglia, which is, nor uh, which is Norfolk and Northum Northumbria to the north of it, 
The latter three were all conquered by Scandinavian armies in, a, in the 800s and their kings killed or deposed, which allowed ex expansive Scandinavian settlement in Eastern and Northern England. But what about Cornwall? Come on. And however, the Kings of Wessex successfully defended their territory from the Viking intruders and eventually went on to conquer the North, creating the unified kingdom of England. So again, where does Cornwall come into this? So what do we wanna know? What we wanna know. But precisely because Wessex remained independent, there has never been much examination of Scandinavian influence in that part of the United Kingdom. But we're beginning to get a different picture, suggesting that Viking leaders such as Sven and his son Canute were active so far south as Devon and Cornwall. So there you go. Now, this is what's interesting. I, and um, I'm not going to ask anyone to guess. You've already worked it out. In 838, the Anglo Saxon Chronicle recorded a battle fought at Hingston Down, there on the map in front of you, in East Cornwall, River Tamar. And the people will remind us that the territory of Cornwall was a lot bigger than it is today than the duchy. Yeah, we know that. In which the local Britons joined forces with the Vikings. They joined forces with the Vikings. They, they actually, the, the local Britons in Cornwall, they actually fought with the Vikings, not against them, with the Vikings. That's really important. Against King Egelbert of Wessex. And were fiercely wanting to prevent his attempts of expanding the kingdom of Wessex and conquering the old land of Demonia, 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 the old kingdom of Cornwall. <coughs> the fiercely independent Cornish appear to have held out against West Saxon control from Wessex and presumably cast around uh, for a strong ally in their fight. So they cast around and those damnable Vikings sided with them. But why were Viking leaders interested in aiding the Cornish? I mean, this, this is really interesting stuff, actually. Perhaps it was a political move made in the hope of gaining a foothold in the peninsula in order to use it as a strategic base against Wessex and all the other kingdoms that, that didn't like them, including those damnable kingdoms of Cumbria. Let's, let's, let's spoil them and we need a base in Cornwall as of the Viking thinking. If, the, if so, it was thwarted as the allied army was soundly defeated. Oh my God, Pete, sorry. They were defeated. The, the Cornish and the Vikings were defeated yeah, at Hingston Down. That's that, that, wow, the end of the world. There are also records of raids um, for plunder in the West Country. A Viking fleet sailed up the River Tamar, there it is on the map, in 997, attacked the uh, Abbey of Tavistock and brought back treasure to their, their ships. This was in 997. I don't think the Cornish really cared at that point. There is further evidence indicating Scandinavians in the West Country, so sort of, sort of looking at Somerset as well as Devon and Cornwall. And what the interesting thing is, I've got a couple of interesting things to show you a site known as Cardinham Churchyard, which we'll look at in a moment. And in Cornwall, alongside all the, all the native art forms and, and, and every, other, every other art form that you can chuck at it, right? And Pete wants me to use the word Celtic. All these different art forms in Cornwall, there's a Scandinavian art form as well. There's the Scandinavian carving in Cornwall. There's lots of carvings in Cornwall, but the Scandinavian corm, carvings in Cornwall. And at Cardinham Churchyard, in West Cornwall, there's there's a there's a cross, there's a, there's an ornate shaft with a cross, which we'll see in a moment, um, and it says a Norwegian ring chain ornament decorates the cross. Now I really tried to find I really tried to find a little bit more detail, and I really couldn't find it. But let's go to Cardinham Churchyard in Cornwall. So there, there's that map there. What the hell happened there oh yes do you know what i looked at that and i couldn't work out why i had four black boxes <laughs> I, it's the, the, the cross of saint Piran. yeah i you know pete I, I had a complete blonde moment then i thought <laughs> i thought there was meant to be an image in those in those four boxes and I thought, where are they and i just realized it was it was it's the cornish flag of 
there you Patron go. Patron saint of tin miners, yeah. Exactly, like it. What a silly mistake of mine. But anyway, this this is the, this is that shaft, and I, I wanted to get a bit more detail in regards to this church, which is there, Cardinum, which is um, which, which is um, uh, east of Tavistock and sort of in, in in the good old sort of Cornwall. So we've got this. There there it is, sort of overlooking the road, it's like it's still standing, and there it is. And it and it, it again. The, my notes describe this as having a Norwegian ring chain ornament um, decorates the cross. So the cross itself, can't get any more detail on that, in Cardinum Churchyard in East Cornwall. And then a mounted warrior in one of the panels of um, Copplestone Cross near Crediton in Mid-Devon. So obviously it's not Cornwall, but there you go. So there's lots of Scandinavian stuff down there. Both are matched by examples in Northern England in the Viking Age but seem out of place in the West. Late versions of the hogback memorial stones, which we will see in, um, in Cumbria, which have a pronounced ridge and, and look like a small stone longhouse, a well-known in Cornwall too. The best example is at Lanivet near Bodmin. Now, I didn't have enough time to look at that. And maybe I might go to that one, like a hogback Memorial stone. I like to do that, and and, and like to look at that, and, and then obviously um, that would be interesting. So I might do that for next week. So I'm sort of trying to get these things together, trying to get this sort of idea together. So these sort of memorials were popular in Norse settlements in Cumbria. You got in Cornwall. Not that we've got them in Cymru, actually. No. And we're we're starting to get nice indications of of, of some nice earlier stuff in in Orkney as well it, it, it's a bit slow but it's coming we don't really have the type of carved stonework that we get in the likes of Cumbria and Cornwall in Cymru but what we do have is really nice evidence of archaeology in, in Anglesey which which we will go to I got a little bit more information at the Battle of um, the Battle of Higston Down as soon as you probably never come across it again, I'll, 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 I will, I will give you a little bit more about the battle. So just sort of go back to that image there. There you go, Higston down. That uh, nice. Let, let's just sort of give you a bit. Might never come across this again. So here we go. So it's in in eight thirty eight. It was an Anglo-Saxon victory that we said, and they were ranged against the the, the Danish Vikings, the Danish Vikings, and the the Cornish. The Cornish. And we know, we believe that it was King Dungarth of Cornwall that led the charge on the Cornish and Viking side against King Egbert, king of the Anglo Saxon kingdom of Wessex. The British kingdom of Dumnonia, which I was trying to say earlier on, which covered Cornwall and it extended all the way into Devon. So Cornwall was a lot bigger at one time, extending past the River Tamar. There you go. Survived into, survived into the 800s when Eastern Devon was conquered by Wessex. So the Cornish are obviously not happy with this. They, they've lost their Devon counterparts. Conflict continued then. And in 815, King Egbert raided Cornwall from east to west, which given later battles at Gaffleford and Hingersdown probably indicates the conquest of the remaining parts of West Devon and then into Cornwall. When we, we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, actually, there's a direct link. We, we mentioned about the raids into Cornwall using the Roman roads, the, the, the roads that, that had been uh, utilised by the Romans, and it was easier to get into Cornwall using those roads and going all the way to select the likes of the Lizard. So in 838, the Cornish allied with a great ship army of Vikings to fight the West Saxons, but were defeated at Higston Down. This was the last recorded battle between the Cornish and the West Saxons and ended roughly a, a century of warfare that began at the Battle of Logborth in 710. And that battle was led by the great King Geraint of Cornwall. Geraint of Demnonia. So I've come across Geraint and um, 
and always, 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 it would be nice for for Pete to us to have another Cornish trip sometime, and Pete to listen to that lecture that we had from looking at all these different kings and so on. So the last known king of Cornwall, Dungarth, who died in 875, had been involved in this battle trying to lead the forces against the West Saxons. But after the Battle of 838, King of Cornwall, King Dungarth, after the battle in 838 at Higston Down, he becomes subservient to the Kingdom of Wessex. And King Athelstan set the modern day boundary of the um, county at the Tamar, indicating continued cultural and ethnic distinction, albeit under his um, overlordship. So in other words, after 838, the Cornish was subservient to Wessex. But do you know what, Pete? I'm going to side with you on this one. He's still a king. He's still a king of the Cornish. Dungarth is that great king of the Cornish until 875. Whether he's got to pay homage to the um, um, to the West Saxons, the the, the um, Kingdom of Wessex, right? They're independent in heart and spirit, as you still are, Peter. As I feel with my own land. So there you go. So I wanted to do that. So it's a, um, something that you you might come across in the future. So this Battle of Higston, eight thirty eight Cornish and the Vikings siding together. I think that's a nice little one. You always hear it the other way that the Vikings are always fighting alone and so on. They're always fighting against us when, in fact, they were allied with us. I like that one. So let's sort of, um, let's see where we are now. So Higston, River Tamar, Boundary, so on. Um, and that stone, here we go. Moving on, Cardinum Church. And now, oh, we're directly into North Wales. Love it. We, we, I'll show you where we are, actually. Lots of bones found. Just show you where we are. So Lambadrygoch. So Lambadrygoch. If you want to know, is up there where the little cursor is on Anglesey. And interestingly enough, interesting enough, if you if looking at archaeological evidence per se, that we we've got we we've got lots of indications of the Vikings being in Cymru even though it's it's sort of tentative and, and, and not massive and you know we're, we're, we're still trying to work out things and so on and so on you can see that all these 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 blue dots indicate viking influence sculpture it's rather interesting you've got these sink coin find, finds the, these boxes coin finds find up here so if you go across the landscape as well uh you've got it's indicating settlements. And that little one there, hidden, you can just about see it, is actually very near me and Peter. That's at the Atlantic Trading Estates, so the Viking settlement there as well. So there are these Viking settlements, but they're mainly along the coast. Ignore uh, Merseyside, but they're mainly along the coast. This sort of influence and sort of indications of raids and place names as well. Talking about topographical place names. Swainsey, there you go. And look at that, Pete. Mm. The home island. There you go, flat home. You've got steep home as well. Yeah. So, so you've got, there's, there's lots of Viking. When you, when you listen to archaeologists, they usually say there's not much Viking stuff going on in Wales. But, you know, that, that, that's quite a bit really, isn't it? It's, it's, it's quite a nice, nice chunk of uh, what's going on. So if we go back wow. to, yeah, go on. And at, in Milford, there was as many as 50 ships would overwinter there. And the, the, the village of Uppertson is named after a Viking. And that's going to be under the topographical names. Well, look at that, Pete. Yeah. I don't know which, look, I don't know, did you say the Huff, Huffington? Huffington. Uh, which, which one's that? Uh, Hubbardston. Which... Hubbardston is yeah. a village named after Hubbard, who was a Viking leader. So which one of these purple dots is that then? Because he's a. He's I'm not a, sure. But it's in the. Um, I, I would say it's probably that that one in the in the. Uh, in the Milford Avon itself, in the Avon. That one by you? No, down down a bit lower. No, that, no, in the Avon. Right there, more likely there. Bingo. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so the dot on the other side. See the orange dot. Yeah. 
uh, that would would probably have been the uh, that that would be closer to the area actually that that one because it was that side is uh, that side of the estuary is Aberton. Yeah. Excellent. Nice. Like it. Like it. Now the Vikings they would always overwinter in estuaries like this. Uh, the Severn Estuary obviously was a good one. They were driven out of uh, Somerset when they landed on Plateau. But looking at the River Fowl, obviously there's an estuary which they could have used as a, a, a safe anchorage for winter or whatever. And I'm sure they may, they may well have been there as well. But where the, uh, that battle occurred, of course, that is another estuary where they would have, been, they would have uh, had safe anchorage. Back to Cornwall, exactly, exactly. Yep. And, and 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 the one the one thing is you got the Battle of Higston and you think, well, Higston, and you think, you know, you always get this idea that the Vikings are, you know, the, the strong men of fighting and and there's not many battles that the Vikings actually won in in my in my book, really. They um Oh they, they were driven out of Somerset and landed on Platon. And they definitely lost the Battle of Stamford Bridge against Harold in um was it the the twenty yeah the uh, 21st of September um, in 1066. So, and you've got Weymouth Harbour as well and all these other things. But yeah. what we're going to do now, so if we go to Lambridge-Igoch, there we go. So if we go back again, and we've got some archaeological evidence. So that, that's, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to tentatively do now. Uh, Lambridge-Igoch on Anglesey is home to one of Wales's most interest in archaeological sites and it's interesting massively interesting because it, it's 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 that viking stuff you know it, the viking stuff there you go so the site was discovered in 1994 i remember when it was discovered by the very eminent dr mark redknapp and it was discovered in 1994 national museum of wales after a number of finds were brought to the museum for identification these included an anglo-saxon penny of Cynnyrdorth, um, Cynnyrdorth, uh, my pronunciation is probably quite right there. It's spelled C-Y-N-E-T-H-R-Y-T-H. So we've got a coin there um, and he, he died around 792. So got an Anglo-Saxon coin there and that, that, that sort of dates the site. And then suddenly they, they, thought they found a penny of Walfred of Canterbury, about 810, bingo that those were trade objects because I actually found three Viking lead weights at the site as well. So that's great. So the bodies, the body that you're actually looking at has been, has been earmarked as a Viking body. So at the site, they, they, they were intrigued that, that, that not only had they found a Viking site, they had actually uncovered a site that had activity going back over 5,300 years. So people had lived within that area for, you know, over 5,000 5, years. It was great. A period when most of the large burial chambers on Anglesey were built. This site was occupied back then. Several items of pottery, radiocarbon dating to um, the Iron Age into the Roman period, that's found there as well. But what is of massive interest, or is massive in, what was, what is, what's of more interest to us today is the Vikings. The activity of the site can be broken up into different phases. So they, they, they found a ditch and let, let's look at this ditch. It's just sort of, I'd, I'd love to spend more time on this site. I really would because you've got, you've got archeology, span you've got buildings, you've got this ditch and you've got bodies in it. It's lovely. And you've got this really hefty wall on the left there. It's a really chunky ditch. It's really, really impressive piece of archeology. span so you've got everything there. You can look at this for ages and sort of I could give a whole talk on this. But anyway, back to my notes. And so, so you've got this ditch. So the excavation uncovered post holes cut into bedrock, thought to represent a platform of a house. <coughs> Items um, the recovered suggest that the ditch is pre-Viking, but the bodies ended up in it in the Viking period. Um, and you've got evidence of a large timber hall and post holes and so on. This timber hall itself appears to be replaced in about the eight and the nine and nine hundreds. And there's two halls there that they found excavated evidence of two halls. They got really nice evidence of the eight nineties and nine seventies. So when anyone ever says to you, 
nobody lived in Wales um, before the um, before the Normans. They did archaeological evidence, and it's it's not just that we've got Viking evidence. It's not we got local evidence as well, and it's it's great that we've got that, and they've got a large hole there over twelve meters in 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 length, dating to around a thousand years AD, and a small section of stone paving, and they've got entrances and small buildings and and um, some of the evidence has been destroyed by a plowing. They got evidence for walls, evidence of bronze buckets, iron knife blades, and so on. And they got a rubbish dump there as well. And in a rubbish dump, when I excavated in the rubbish dump, they, they found a coin um, associated with the Archbishop Wing, Wingmund of Northumbrian, Northumbria. Uh, this dated to about the, the 850s. And they've got evidence of uh, leather work and mounts and bucket bindings and so on. Um, so forming one of the largest collections. So, so this site itself, they, they, they got the, the evidence that they've got, the evidence that they've got is that this site itself, um, was in a sheltered location at about a hundred, about a thousand meters from the sea. So it was quite sheltered. Um, Forming one of the, this site itself, Lambadai Gok, um, early, early pre pre Viking evidence, post Viking evidence, Viking evidence. It's a really key, massive site to think about the Vikings in in Wales, Anglesey. Uh, it's a very important site. The evidence is really well preserved. You've got that wonderful wall there. You've got the ditch. You've got the bodies in the ditch. You've got the trading evidence and so on and so on. Um, and some people have argued whether this was this was a direct Viking occupied site or whether it was a, a site that traded with the Vikings. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the enclosure at Lambadigoth appears to be the key to unlock further secrets and reveal the nature of Viking age settlement, which has puzzled scholars for decades. So we'll leave that bit there. It's a nice end on that bit. So it sort of gives a bit of an overview. What is the site about? Is the Viking site? Is there an influ a site influenced by the Vikings? Who are those people? Why were they killed? Um, and all these other little bits and pieces. All this evidence is so great to have evidence from Wales about the Vikings. Because and then 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 we start to find it all over the place. When I say we start to find it all over the place, we start to find more Viking evidence. Like we find more Roman evidence. Lots of lots of prehistoric evidence. So we just we just look at some nice little images. So I, I just it's great when you've got sort of you're looking at um, uh, skeletal remains around that period of, of those Viking links. And we've got the excavations with a the floor surface there, very close to the surface, actually. The, the archaeology isn't too deep. And they've got this really thick, chunky wall that, that survived as well. It was a really deep ditch. You've got one set of human remains there, another set of human remains, a third set of human remains, another set of human remains in this ditch, all these and little bits of walls being built and all this wonderful evidence. So it'd be good to actually maybe, maybe go on to this in, 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 the, in the future, actually. Um, but it's great that we've actually got a nice bit of Viking evidence, finally, uh, within, within our own land of Cymru. So that, 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 that's great. Cumbria. Ooh, let's go to Cumbria. So, so we're, we're, we're into Cumbria now. And I, I was just... I was just looking at Cumbria and I thought, right, there's lots of there's lots of evidence associated with the Vikings in in Cumbria. And I want to do a little bit more about the Vikings in Cumbria next week, actually, as much as I want to do a lot more about the Vikings in Orkney next week. And but maybe vi visit again Lambradoch um, in Anglesey again next week. So we've we've got we we mentioned about we mentioned about the the Viking the, the Vikings being in Cumbria already we've already mentioned that and the North Sea the North Eastern Irish Sea new settlements with Norse place names. So what we do find is that we've got Viking place names, uh, Viking um, and, and we we. One of the things about Cumbria is a rather interesting place, Cumbria, for place names, because in Cumbria you've actually got um, you've actually got Welsh words as localities. And interesting enough, it's just one word out the top of my head. It's actually got its own roots. 
we've got our own roost as well. And so you've got Welsh, you've got Welsh names there, um, Cymru, um, um, Cymru, um, Cymraeg names, that's what I'm looking for. And then you've got Viking names there, you've got sort of Anglo-Saxon type names, and Angle names there as well. And obviously it's so close to Hadrian's Wall. So there's a lot going on in Cumbria. And I, it, it's, it's a vet, Cumbria, Cumbria out of places to go. It has to be one of the weirdest bits of Britain. Mind, mind you, it can't be beaten by Norfolk. That's definitely strange as well. Um, and one of the things I thought of when I, when I sort of looked at this, I thought actually um, the, there's lots of carved stones. There lots of re oh, and they've got a reconstructed village there as well. Uh, there's a reconstructed Viking village. I bet you didn't know that. You can you can see a reconstructed Viking village in Cumbria. Now, so what what we've got this this is what I was referring to earlier on, uh, earlier on as hogback tombs. They 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 they're tombs. They they're shaped like a hog's back. So hence, hog's back. Two, hogged back. Um, and this is a, a St. Mary's Church at Gosforth. And I know I've looked at these before. I know I have. And again, I, 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 I touched upon, I, I do believe, I, I do believe I touched upon, I touched upon Cumbria yesterday, actually, when I, when I was looking at early churches and stuff in Cumbria. And I didn't mention anything about the Viking carved stone, but it, you've got this the sandstone here, and it, it's been really eaten away by by the environment. But this is a, a Penrith, not Penrith in Cornwall, but Penrith in Cumbria, St Andrew's Church, and we've got the these this is this is known as the the lock the locky stone in Kirby. And that, there it is, the Locky Stone, and a nice little sort of, it, it mentions, if we can sort of zoom in on this one, a little bit of description. What does this description say? The Locky Stone is an Anglo-Saxon Danish cross shaft. My God. So it's got a bit of Anglo-Saxon, got a bit of Viking in there. Check that in there. Cross, cross shaft um, into the horn figure of a chained devil uh, represented by the old Norse god Loki. Loki. It is believed to be one of the earliest Christian symbols. This is the only example in Britain and only one of two in Europe. Um, and it's sort of dated to about the 10 hundreds, but I'll probably date it to a bit earlier. So it's, it's a, um, it's an, you can't, can't make this up. It's an Anglo-Saxon, Viking, Christian, devil, Loki, carved stone. Which is typical, very typical, because it, it's sort of it's very Pictish in the way it does. In, very Pictish in the way it works, because with with Pictish art, you've usually got lots of Pictish art, and it was a completely different genre, and you, you've got it sort of hidden on the Christian stuff, and it, and it's really odd that really odd. So again, we got we got looking at this, and we got the hogback stones. I, I really love these. This is at um, Gosforth church saint mary's church and celtic it, not work what's that pete celtic not work yeah no. yeah no viking viking yeah okay but it's still celtic not work still viking <laughs> well it's it, it to be on to be honest with you um I, th I think I think I think the main the, the biggest Viking stuff here is the one on the right. That that yeah, that's the hogback, and obviously, obviously as I as I described the the um, the description of Loki earlier on, mm. and I and I and I mentioned different styles. So you're right. So there there are lots of styles. There's lots of the sort of intermingling. So you could talk about the knot work being in the panel below, mm. but then you then above. You, you've got something that that's very different than than any not work style, um, and then then you've got the braiding around the outside on the left, um, and, but more of a galosh pattern. You've got a bit of a beast there as well, and it, it's just very interesting. You've got this in Saint Mary's Church, and um, alongside some little books and sort of, and it's great. I love it. 
so then then the other thing as well is the other thing as well is that we've go to this building and I, I just I just come across this by complete mistake and I come across this by complete mistake and it's a site known as Moor Forge. There's a site called Moor Forge in Cumbria and the Moor Forge Viking settlement. Now if I'd have known this site existed maybe when we were coming back on the maybe when we were coming back from the trip in Adrian's Wall I'd have visited this site but I didn't know it existed. So Moor Forge is a Viking heritage Discovery settlement, the in development that they're still developing it, and it's near the Viking settlement at Gill Crook, on the edge of the Lake um, District National Park. And so you're looking at one of the um, main longhouses that they've actually reconstructed there. And they've got workshops there. You know the typical sort of reconstructed type village that you get with these, and they, they've got living history nights. And I just, I just looked at this and I thought it was absolutely fascinating. And um, they, they have displays there, but it's probably unlikely they've be, been able to manage to do much uh, this year. Um, and I just got, um, I'm wondering if on my slides, I've, I'm showing you this image that I'm looking at. So I'm missing an image. So I'm gonna sort of bit of a screen share, this little bit of an article I've got in front of me uh, there. One of the other reconstructed buildings and so, so these, this is very similar to the buildings that, that we were seeing at Bursa earlier on, where you've got the shallow walls and then you've got the timbers creating an apex, a gable end, and you've got a bay, that's the bay. And they're, they're very much constructed to actually keep as much heat in them as possible, as we see with the typical Viking longhouse, which we could probably have a little bit more of a look at next week. That's sort of a bit of a reconstruction there at this site in Cumbria. <laughs> and I don't know if there's anything else on this that we could probably show you. Uh, and basically the site is owned by a, a local, a local um, blacksmith who's sort of reconstructing this site. Uh, it's a, and you've got a skilled team of reconstructors there and you've got these long houses and helmets and shields and all these wonderful things. And in Gilcrook itself, which is near Moor Forge, St. Mary's Church. Um, it's, it's, it's got at this Gill Crook site, it, as it said, it's got the remains of a Viking cross dating to the 900s. They've got this reconstructed site and they've got Viking evidence nearby at this site known as Gill Crook at the church of St. Mary's Church. You've got all these wonderful carved stones around. There's a bit of a bit of a, some details there if anyone wants to copy them down quickly. So what we're going to do, um, I'm going to call that a night on that because it was a sort of nice end to look end at a reconstructed village. And if we can sort of stop that screen share and sort of last show you this sort of image again, bit of a Viking reconstruction. And you can put your mic on now, Claire. So that so there you go. That that's that. Um, so I'm just going to see if there are any questions. Anyone got any questions? Claire, you first, darling. I enjoyed tonight. Thank you. I've recently been reading up on the Cornish and the Vikings, and it's really good. Thank you. So I enjoyed much. it. Thank you. So a, a little bit more of this next week. I, actually, actually, Claire, right? If you want, if you wanted to join us next week, just for another Wednesday yeah. session to make up with. Um, for a couple that you've missed, right? Join us next Wednesday. I know. Okay? As well as Tuesday. I'm awful sorry. It's still, it's still really crazy in work. I thought it would have been slackening off by now. Yeah, it's, it's got a, it's got a bit, it's got a bit crazy with us as well. We've, uh, you know, it, we, we've, we've, um, go on. They took 1.5 million last week. That, that's quite. It, it, what in just one day or a week? A week in my little store. Oh my God. So make sure if, if you ever end up disappearing, right, we know where the money's gone. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, right, right, Pete, you've got a little map you want to show yeah, us. Yeah, I've got a map. If we see Milford Avon, that's where Albertson is. And wherever that orange dot was on your map, 
would be Abbotton. So point it with your finger Viking on there settlement. now. What's that? Point it with your finger. Speak. There. That's Abbotton. Point it with your finger again. Excellent. We got that. Where the green is. Excellent. Thank you yep. very much. Hubbardston. Hubbardston. You, that's it. Yep. It, um, so you've come across that with your sort of island uh, research, have you? With the... well, when I did the um, I did the talk on Milford and the defences and the history of Dale Fort and all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that went back to the, the Viking. There was as many as 50 ships would be overwintering there. And the leader was Hubbardston. Hubbard, and they named that the village after him, Hubbardston. Excellent. And one, one, one thing, one thing that I, I can remember doing when I was doing my university course years ago, is that there's um, is is that there's waves of place names. Like if you come across the word ham, that that's an indication of a Viking site. An ing, that's another indication of a Viking site as well. Different different waves of Viking sites. So Pat, what about you, darling? Oh, that was interesting. Good, good, Thank good. You. And oh. And also, what we what we need to do, we need right, Pam. When you put your mic on, right, make sure we can hear you clearly. So go for it, and don't bark. And can you hear me clearly? We can hear yeah. you clearly. Oh, goody good. Um, I don't know. I haven't got anything to say really. I sound I just, like you. Yeah, I know. Um, the fifty Viking, I think it was Vikings that were beheaded. Where was that again? Wait, Weymouth Harbour. Way mess, that's that. That's strange, uh, actually, 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 do you know what I do as a special treat? Right, I'm going to type right now and I'm going to show you that image. Right. Yeah, go on then. We're, we're going to do that. Weymouth Harbour. I've been to Weymouth Harbour, but I didn't know that. You didn't end up with a Viking skull in your bag, did you? No. no. But there's Wait. another safe anchorage for them, you see. Hmm. I, 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 all I got is bloody. Oh, hang on. Viking. A Viking. Oh, hang on. I come up with Viking boats. That's no good. Viking skulls. Let's have a look at this one. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. It's all over the bloody shop. Right. Um. Somebody's trying. Hang on. Ah oh, no! I put Way Harbour. That's the wrong bloody Weymouth. Oh God. Right. Weymouth Harbour. Ah, I got it. Um. How do I do this now? Right. So ready to screen share? Let's have a look at these skulls. Right. Uh, go for it. <coughs> right. So there they are. What they did, they, they beheaded 300 of them. 300? Oh yeah, 300 Vikings. There they go. The big, big pile of skulls. And you can see where they cut through there. And, and then they've got, they got the rest of the bodies. Uh, oh, there, so that, that's based, that's, that what so that's what you've got. You've got all the bones in one area and the skulls in another area. Um, mm. And what they're so what they're showing there is that the way they the, they they they've actually been cut through. Oh, there you go. That that's that that shows it. So you've got a big pile of skulls and you've got a load of bodies. So what I what I've always said is that the um, the Vikings have got quite a ferocious reputation. But most of the evidence tells us that they 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 that they were they weren't the great warriors that, that we hear about in history. They they they've um, you know when you look at York they 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 captured York and then they were thrown out of York and and um, you got the same with Dublin. That, that's that's another image of it there. And it's I think it's um, known as the Dorset Ridgeway site, um, Weymouth. Wait, Weymouth Harbour there. So if you ever want to look up that information, um, go ahead. Yeah. It's quite, quite a gruesome sight, actually. It's just a lot of it. Yeah. In that area, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. That, that, but I think, I think Pete got a bit excited one day. Hmm. I don't think he likes Vikings. Mind you, Pete should like Vikings because they fought alongside his great kings. Oh. You know. Because it, Vikings always okay. use estuaries, Thank you. I've never thought of looking for Vikings in Cornwall, but next time I'm down there, I'm going to look at the Fowl Estuary because I'm sure they would have that they would have overwintered there. Yeah. 
and, and why not? And you've got different types of Vikings as well because oh, you've well, got of course. these are the Danish Vikings. Yeah, and you've got mm. the Norwegian Vikings coming in Ireland. They had a bit of both. They had the Norwegian, and they had the um, they, yeah. they had the Norwegian Vikings coming from the north, and they had the Danish Vikings coming from the south. That caused a bit of a problem because there were two yeah. different types of Vikings. Yeah. And then obviously you've got the Swedish Vikings going into um, Russia, and you've got some Swedish Vikings on the Norfolk coast. You know, Rydwald and and Sutton Who, and then you've got the Finnish Vikings, which are a different kettle of fish altogether. Mm. The, the Finnish, the Finnish Viking women, they they've got um, hairs on parts of their bodies that you wouldn't then recognise. Oh, they're very nice to Finnish women. Women, and, and they go around bandicing axes against men that they don't like. Isn't that right, Michelle? <laughs> yeah, Michelle tells me. Yeah, and if you if you're a um, having if, been to Finland in the winter, yes, you've been there, have you? Yes, in you, so, you, so you didn't buy a round of drinks then, Pete. <laughs> Uh, no, no, but we did. We had well, we were iced in, and we had to walk across these frozen river to get to the village to get a pint. Mm -hmm. And it was two miles across the river, another mile and a half into town. And we would do that just to go in and get a drink. Ah, oh, but you still wouldn't buy a brown. Anyway, <laughs> so on that note, we're going to be doing more of the Viking comparison next week. If if there's if there's no more questions, I I will be uh, I will be seeing pa um, Pam tomorrow morning, Pat in the afternoon, um, and I. Um, which ones are you doing, Jessica's class tomorrow evening? And any of you guys? No. No. Oh, okay, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That should be a strange bunch. Um, and and um, and obviously I will see Claire next Tuesday and Wednesday. Yeah. Um, and, and we'll go from there. So if there's no other questions, um, I'll, oh, and, and um, not, well, not, not for this class, but, um, but um, don't forget your, 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 your class, um, two monthly monies will be start due this, this week and next week. So I've yeah. already paid it today. Yeah, but I, I, I just, I just said that deliberately to wind you up because I, I know it went in today because I saw it. <laughs> So, so just be just be wary of that, folks. So uh, it's due sort of this week and next week and whatever. So that's good. That's with you guys. It's forty-eight pounds. Job done. I've done that. So if there's no more questions, we'll more Vikings next week. Any unanswered questions? May look at this building next week as well, and um, look a lot more about Orkney. Actually, that so, battle would have been in Plymouth Sound. Say that again, Pete. That battle that you look would have been in Plymouth Sound. Yes, with the reliance on the ships. Yep. So I'm going to bid you fair good night okay. now to Pat. Okay. See you tomorrow. See you next week, Claire. See you tomorrow, Pam. Bye. Pete, I'll see you on the moon and I'll see you soon. Thank you very much for your support okay. tonight. Take care. Yeah. Bye, -bye. Bye everybody. Bye. Happy Bye. New Year to Bye. everybody. Cheerio. Night night. Night night. Night night. Night night. The little people, beware. Beware, beware. Right, that's it. Anyway, thanks for watching and see you guys. And in, in Pam's still there, lingering about. Thank you very much.